Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So nice to be back. I was in Japan and Hong Kong. Uh, it was really cool to visit and get to know a little bit about the, the Shinto culture in Japan and really feel the aliveness of the land uh, in some of these remote areas. And then uh, in Hong Kong, got to uh, present at a really interesting monastery there that's kind of dedicated itself, though it in form looks like an 8th century monastery. It really wants to translate Buddhist teachings to contemporary populations, so they want to bring in the science of meditation, science of a meaningful life. Um, so that was, yeah, really meaningful to be there. And there was this huge Kuan Yin uh, statue, so you could really feel the presence of compassion there. And one of the rooms I taught in was literally under the feet of Kuan Yin, <laughs> uh, which was kind of an interesting feeling. And it is a bronze statue, so I was slightly worried the whole time like that it might just tumble um, down upon us, but what a way to go, <laughs> right? <laughs> Crushed by compassion. I was like, all right, this is fine. Um, yeah, and really, it's always inspiring to just see, you know, the different ways that Buddhism has kind of traveled and become alive throughout the world. Um, I know sometimes we've talked about it here, but it's, it's interesting to see how this um, this teacher and these teachings have spread in so many different places and mixed with cultures and um, kind of created their own form. And I think this book is one beautiful example of that. So some of you, we've been working our way through, we're on chapter six now uh, of this eighth century text, but that was given secondary commentary by Pema Chodron, a contemporary nun in the Tibetan Buddhist lineage, and she really weaves in the psychological nuance that this text can point us to. So just, yeah, quite a meaningful um, journey that we're on here. And I'm Eve, if I haven't met you before, welcome, welcome, welcome. And the, uh, the essence of this text, as I've mentioned recently, but it, it really bears mentioning again, is so appropriate for this moment, <laughs> so important for this time. You know, the whole kind of gestalt of this text is how do we live with an open heart as the world is on fire? And very explicit instructions on cultivating this heart of the bodhisattva or the heart of the awakened being who dedicates their life for the sake of all beings. And this chapter that we're on now is uh, about developing these three disciplines. These disciplines being not causing harm, gathering virtue, and benefiting others. And in our last session together, before I left on these travels, we were talking about this discipline of non-harming, and the analogy given for non-harming is to be like a log. So when you feel pride, when you feel aversion, when anything arises that might thwart you from your path, be like a log. But the translation that Minja Rinpoche offers is really to be like a tree, you know, to be rooted and to have that stability at your base. And this week we'll be talking more uh, about this, this aspect of um, being able to gather virtue. And, and that term might seem a little strange. It might seem like we're trying to acquire something or get something from the world, gathering virtue. But the real essence of this gathering virtue is how can we, you know, identify and remove the obstacles between us and our deepest loving nature. That's really the gathering of virtue. And I think there's some very beautiful, pithy instructions of how to make that ideal into action. So that's what we're going to get into today. Hi, friends online. Nice to see you. Hope you're warm and cozy. Mm -hmm. I feel like this time of year when it's darker and colder, this room gets a little emptier. <laughs> Online gets a little more full. Um, whatever, whatever works. And for all of these practices, you know, we are delving into 
kind of two main aspects of training the heart and mind, really bringing forth these qualities of developing clear, sustained attention and bringing forth practices that can make the heart feel that tenderness, that quivering, that ability to open towards. These don't have to be separate, doesn't, you know, you don't have to do them totally apart, but I think it is beneficial to give ourselves the chance to familiarize with these different practices. In um, our small group meetings, we're focusing a bit more right now on this cultivation of attention or shamatha. And tonight I'd like to invite us to do that again. And in this, I think it's a really interesting practice to recognize that our attention, though largely can feel like it's out of our control, is something we deliberately choose where to place and to start really feeling that choice uh, and not just feeling as in, you know, I, I want this, I'm motivated, but really observing how attention gets diffuse and spread out. And then what does it feel like to direct attention back again over and over and over? And one traditional way of teaching this is given the analogy of uh, the mind like a, a wild stallion, right? Just because, um, you know, we all know wild stallions, right? At least in the movies. Um, so uh, maybe a deer, but the deers are not that, uh, they're not that wild around these parts. Um, and with, what was it? <laughs> a wild chihuahua. <laughs> I don't know if the analogy would hold, but a wild stallion, maybe a wild chihuahua, they want a lot of space, right? They want to have as much space as possible. And so when we start to cultivate shamatha, we don't immediately pen in this wild chihuahua of the mind. We give it as much space as it needs. And in that way, we allow it to be kind of throughout all of our sensory experiences. So allowing the attention to notice what we hear, allowing the attention to notice what we kind of smell or taste, giving it its full reign. And then we slowly kind of like bring in our attention as though, and again, this is just hypothetical, but if we bring the wild chihuahua <laughs> of the mind slowly into smaller and smaller areas, it will naturally calm itself instead of all at once, just try, okay, focus on the breath. Um, for many of us, that is a challenging, if not impossible, thing to do immediately when we sit down. Because what we are doing most of our day and most of our time is attending to many things in the external world. So let's slowly bring our attention inward. So that's where we will start. Um, so let's find a posture that supports attention. And, you know, I mentioned already, it's cold and dark. It can be hard to find the vibrancy of our practice. So for folks sitting on a chair, if you want to come forward on your chair, that helps the back be more upright. And giving ourselves a moment to really feel and connect to the natural uprightness of the spine. And we can do this movement that I have seen so often His Holiness the Dalai Lama do where he finds his meditation posture by kind of circling around. So he circles to the right and forward and left and back and just allowing ourselves to feel into and slowly settle into where we feel aligned perfectly ab ab above the sit bones. And as we inhale, we can almost imagine inhaling a sense of length all the way from the sit bones to the top of the head. Feeling a dignity to this posture of practice, even a regality as though sitting on the throne of our meditation. And softening through the forehead and between the brows.
softening and relaxing through the eyes and the cheekbones. Softening the jaw and the heart. Softening the belly and the whole front of the body. And as we hear the opening bell, inviting ourselves to really inhabit this posture, finding the softness through the front, as well as the strength and vividness through the back. Right as we enter into practice, inviting this intention of bodhicitta, the awakened heart. Remembering that this practice is not only for us, but the practice that moves through us as compassion, as love, as our availability to this world, which so desperately needs our love and compassion. As we ease into this practice, we give ourselves the full range of sensory experiences to explore, letting our attention find its way through what we hear, what we can sense in the body, any smells or tastes, and even any play of light behind closed eyes or if eyes are softly open. So we observe and watch as our attention moves. And of course, we will get caught up with thoughts, memories, images. Once we become aware that we've been caught up, we take a moment to pause and relax. And then find this experience of choosing to return. To observe wherever our attention goes. So not directing it to one area or the next, but also not getting caught up in rumination, keeping that awareness of our attention as it moves from the sounds within the room to the sensations within the body and back again.
Mm. Observing and noticing uh, movements of attention. We now shift our attention and awareness more deliberately to the field of tactile sensation in the body. And as we attend to the sensations in the body, we do so with such simplicity. Instead of wondering what we are feeling or why we are feeling, just allowing whatever is felt to be simply felt. As though our attention were a searchlight that we could direct single pointedly just to the sensations throughout the body. And every time you recognize you've been caught up, just simply relax. Give yourself to fully noticing this choosing to bring our attention back. Feeling the full energy and intention of choosing to come back and attend closely to the sensations in the body just as they are. Gently, deliberately, precisely, shifting this searchlight of our attention away from the sensations in the body and to sound, what can be experienced through the sense portal of hearing. And as we receive sounds that are near and sounds that are far, steady, intermittent, Again, doing so just as they are, without any projection or preference. Our full attention and awareness to hearing, receiving sound.
it is so natural, familiar, comfortable for us to let the mind carry away our attention. It is a habit. But we can strengthen another habit, the one of naturally returning over and over, deliberately placing our attention and seeing if we can feel just that experience of deliberately placing our attention back once again. The regathering of our attention. And continuing a bit longer here on simply letting what is heard be heard. Noticing all that can be experienced through the sense portal of sound. Can you notice the brightness right when you return from having been carried away? That sense of the regathered attention, being fully present with our sensory experience. We will gently shift and precisely shift our attention and awareness to the sense portal of sight and seeing. And so inviting our chin to be a bit closer to the chest so that our gaze is downward towards the lap. And before we blink our eyes open, Feel or imagine the possibility of receiving what is seen as though it were being seen for the very first time. Without any projection or preference. Receiving light and shape and color. So gently blinking the eyes open and allowing what is seen to be simply seen and received with all of our attention and awareness.
For most of us, this sense portal of sight is our dominant sense portal. But what is it like to simply receive what is seen without anything changing? Just allowing ourselves to become absorbed in the texture, the color, the shape. Very gently blinking the eyes closed and returning the head to rest evenly on top of the neck. And we shift our attention and awareness to these very subtle sense portals. What we can experience through smell and through taste. Again, without reaching out or projecting, just noticing what is there. Might be simple, just the sense of warmth or moistness in the mouth. Maybe the faintest scent of our own shampoo or other smell in the room. And seeing what it's like to bring our full attention and awareness at this very subtle sense portal. Can we invite our attention to be bright, but not too tight? So very precisely and vividly immersed and saturated with the sense portals of smell and taste. Yet fully experiencing ease and pliancy. Taking a moment to really notice what is the quality of attention when what we are attending to is so subtle. 
And if we're returning from being carried away or caught up, what is that experience of re-immersing ourselves in these subtle sense portals? Once again, shifting this time to the great sense portal of mind and all that arises in the mind, which is, of course, all of our experience. As a thought or memory or image arises, we allow it to pass, move away, just like a sound of a moving car. And if there's a sensation in the body, we allow the sensation to emerge as a phenomena in the mind. Experiencing all of it without any preference or judgment and as much as possible without getting carried away. And if or when we experience some gaps in between the phenomena of the mind, we can bring our attention to awareness, the spacious awareness of mind and consciousness from which all these phenomena arise and pass back into Feeling the mind as the ocean of awareness from which these waves of thoughts or sensations or sounds emerge and then return. And attending closely to these phenomena of the mind.
A couple more moments returning again and again when we get caught up or carried away to attending to this great sense portal of mind. Never so gently feeling as though we are leaning back in the mind, leaning back into that ocean of awareness, turning our awareness right in upon itself. What is that that is paying attention? Can we rest our mind in these gaps, in this vastness in between all the phenomena? Can we rest in this spacious, open, warm awareness? All the phenomena still arising, but making that the background. In the foreground is this restful, spacious, open awareness. without needing to separate ourselves from a sense of spacious awareness, finding ourselves in this body, in this breath, in this shared space and moment, Feeling the body breathing in, and feeling the body breathing out. Thank you for your practice. It's been a little while since we did that practice together. Hopefully that's a nice revisit or for those of you who that's new practice, that's a mindfulness of phenomena. Really wonderful way to get that clear redirection of attention through this very moment in our senses. And it would be great to hear from some folks. I don't know actually where the mic is. Anybody know where the mic is? Oh, Kate. Uh, any reflections or questions uh, on that practice, especially with like a little bit of extra emphasis on redirecting attention, trying to feel that 
as a practice or process. And friends online, feel free to raise a hand or otherwise. So you may still be floating in spacious awareness. The great, yes, please, Andre. Um, for me, it's kind of the trick to do this properly is to keep kind of like, like especially in the first part, like um, on the um, senses. To keep kind of like halfway on the of the awareness on the senses and kind of like halfway on it mm -hmm. and then kind of like walking on a tight rope yeah. so make sure to not fall if you fall on one side then it's the awareness goes thousand percent of the awareness and then you kind of like you carry it away yeah just to kind of keep that balance between the the simultaneity of uh, awareness both on itself but also on the on the appearances um, and uh, uh, in the, the getting back, I always kind of have that feeling that that's kind of like my true, my true me, like that, not force, that get, getting back kind of, mm. that gathering, like the, that movement of getting back, but something like for the very, very, core of myself. Mm. So when you come back, it feels like a more core sense or the action of coming back? Yeah, kind of like the one that does the coming back. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful reflections. I mean, I think that first one, so subtle, the especially once you have some familiarity with this practice, like the attention and awareness, it's a funny one, right? Like we're directing our attention towards, you know, sensation or sound, but really it is also, you know, attention is almost the manifestation of our awareness, right? And so, or one way that our awareness can manifest. So then we're aware of our attention <laughs> that is paying attention to the sound and it can get a little, uh, get a little vertigo in that. So a, a tightrope makes sense. Like it, it feels to me like this very, um, yeah, it's this very precise way that we're directing our attention uh, when we're kind of deliberately placing it somewhere, but we're not just looking back at awareness. Like we're kind of, I, I think it's a very um, supportive practice towards that more open spacious awareness because we've built this kind of specificity and then yeah I, I love that other reflection of you know such a common question in buddhism is you know what is the true nature of mind in tibetan buddhism and kind of you often hear in zen who is aware and that's not just a uh, getting underneath the identity of ego but like really who's paying attention right what what is that quality and to feel it as more authentically you or presence i think that's a very yeah that's a very uh nice texture or quality to have of our own mind to feel that thank you for sharing yeah anyone else question or reflection or objection Was it hard? Mm hmm. Okay. What was hard? <laughs> I can do that one. Okay. <laughs> uh, I got lost in thoughts. I thought yeah. it was really tough. My mind was definitely the one that was most active, and I, I kind of got bored with the sensations in my body because there yeah. weren't many. Oh, I, my foot, I was really nervous that my foot was going to fling off because I was sitting cross-legged and I normally don't. And so I was like, what am I doing? Um, and so that kept distracting me and in sensation. But other than that, I didn't have much going on. And so it was really 
the thoughts. That, uh, but then when you went into the mindfulness, I was relieved because I was in this battle a little bit of, I could feel the awareness. I wanted to be there. Yeah. Um, but I kept getting distracted by it and and I could gather my attention it was more difficult than I had expected at first and it got easier hmm. I think you did it again maybe two or three times and so it did it, it did get easier by the end yeah and um I forget where I was going with the awareness but anyway when you went to the mind it was easier to disconnect the two or know they're one or yeah whichever that way is yeah um and so I was actually relieved to get to the mind. And I did feel a sense of um, sometimes I doing shamatha or attention practices, I can get really like, don't yeah. mess up. Yeah. Um, and so I was able to kind of relax more and I'm more Wonderful. calm abiding. Hey, <laughs> you know, it makes me wonder, and I'd love to ask, you know, like Alan Wallace, this question of what would it mean to do this practice backwards? Right. What would it mean to start in spacious open awareness and then, you know, kind of narrow into each of the sense portals? It's more pleasant. Yeah, it would be anything. I, mean, I, think I, I, uh, I can't imagine that one of these amazing sages who spent however many years in caves didn't try it already. Um, so I would love to see if there's a, a teaching on that because it's an interesting question. Like, would that starting in the spacious open awareness allow? some entry. Uh, this practice is sometimes called the Preta Vihara, which means, to my understanding, you're like withdrawing. You know, it's almost like a practice of dying. Like, what if you could only feel your body? What if there was only sound? What if there was only, like you're kind of this withdrawal as opposed to that um, full emergence and entry. And what they, what you were, saying too is like I, I don't know if this is exactly capturing it but one thing I notice is that when we get caught up in the thoughts we're pulled away it's such a dreamlike quality and then kind of what Andre's pointing to of like then we come here home and it's like oh and then we're like in the dreamlike quality and then you know it, it's funny that we want to go anywhere else and I think a lot of meditation is this you know, reconnection or refamiliarization, which what feels like really home, you know, and, and there's so much benefit of daydreaming, so much creativity and imagination. So it's not like, stay right here in this concrete moment all the time. <laughs> but it's, you know, so much of us, we are living, you know, in, in a dream, you know, in our projected fantasy about what someone thinks of us or what will happen tomorrow or blah, 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 and that so just to kind of experience that quality of differentiation is so powerful. Yeah, it also reminds me, I've been thinking of like direct experience. Yes. Uh, what that feels like or to live in that place. And I feel like some of the body sensations did lend itself to that or like the seeing. Yeah. You know, that's always such a hard one to do where yeah. I just kind of lose it, where it's just like taking it, it's too much. But, yeah. Um, so that one was also challenging the, the mindfulness of seeing. Yeah. Stuff. And it's funny because we would love to just watch something that entertained us nonstop, but something that's like not entertaining, we're like, oh, <laughs> like so quickly tire, right? <laughs> and so it's, it's just, yeah, it's just interesting to kind of find the richness in the direct experience. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, please. Hey, I'll follow up with what was difficult. I guess for me, um, this experience of feeling embodied is very recent mm. uh, in the sense of back in the day, even when I meditated, it was always like getting out of body as soon as like as fast as possible. And mm. like my even my breath becoming so shallow to the point where I feel I'm not breathing. And then at some point you gave me guidance to really exaggerate the breath a little more. And I actually really found that uh, beneficial because um, I think it's hard for me to even like focus on the seeing and the sounds and the body because it's uncomfortable mm. in some degree. Yeah. It feels like there's this 
divine space out there yeah. that I want to go to. And this idea of ha finding that within is uh, something I still have resistance to it. Um, but it, like doing this practice, it feels, um, it, it does feel like a return home and becoming more familiar with the vehicle that I carry. Mm. So even though I was struggling, uh, what opened up was um, this feeling of warmth mm. um, around my head. And on one hand, it was like paying attention to uh, the different senses. It was almost like, oh my God, this is like so much information. I already have like very aware of this wild stallion <laughs> and how wild it is. And then it's like, okay, the sounds and the smell and the seeing, the sight. Um, but at the same time, it does feel like some sort of rooting and mm -hmm. softening in that embrace, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. No, I mean, but it's not yes. necessarily comfortable. It's kind of like there was a struggle the whole time. You, beautiful. But you're describing exactly why most of us try to, you know, not live in the present moment of our bodies and why in some ways the mind is so uh, habituated towards getting out of this moment and this experience because like it's uncomfortable it is i mean it's really it's really i can't remember who says it this way but it's so inconvenient to have a human body right uh, second that like in all you know there's itches and then there's bad smells and then there's like well, you know there's so many things but um I, I would say you could sum up the majority of strategies in this book under the title learning distress tolerance right learning to be with the difficulty of being an embodied human right and when we can do that without needing to go out there or you know move like oh man we're so close to liberation so even seeing it and feeling that it's like just a wonderful way to recognize oh i don't i don't want to be here like, no wonder I go there. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thanks. Oh. It's so good to be sitting with you again. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll talk about what was easy before difficult, but... Um, Interestingly, as I can't remember anything about the beginning of the meditation because I was so lost in thoughts. Yeah. But when we actually got to the senses, um, I, I, it was it, it was very easy for me to focus on to place attention on sensations and on um, sound, right? And you know, going from sound to sound to sound. The the surprisingly one that I, I don't usually work with unless we're doing the whole series is scent. Mm -hmm. And um, I found it incredibly beautiful to notice that, you know, being here in a fragrance free place <laughs> that there is yeah, <laughs> supposedly. So there is uh, there's scent and it's very subtle and and um, with every other sense, there was bouncing from one thing to another. And when I got to scent, it was one constant thing. Mm. And it brought me into, it, it really evened things out and brought me to a, a very open, spacious place. Mm. And then I think we went to sight and then the mind, right? or vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, and when we got to the mind, uh, that's where things were difficult because... Um, <laughs> It was a very subtle chaos, right? A very <laughs> mild chaos going on that wanted to pull my attention in all these mm. different directions. Mm. And I tried to just let them all happen at the same time, which was interesting. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and somewhat successfully. I've been experiencing confusing, confusion recently in being aware of awareness. Mm -hmm. right? I, I've been, it's been a, a hard to understand concept. 
conceptually. Good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how, is, how is the confusion? Uh, it's interesting, but, but it's, it, it's often the same it, or, or similar. Yeah. You know, and it feels, I mean, you described vertigo. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's not quite that, but there's, there's a sensation in the body that is slightly uncomfortable mm. and try, kind of grasping for, yeah. for what it is that I'm, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So there, and there's an in and out of that. There's yeah. There's sometimes where I'm. Oh, I almost have it here. here but <laughs> yeah, it's so funny and beautiful, you know, because it is. In it is um, so part of the nature of the mind to want to know, and then awareness is knowing. But it's that like you know lantern like knowing, not that searchlight knowing. So there's just this different quality and uh, it's so interesting what can be known when we are resting more in that spacious awareness it doesn't it's not it's not void and empty of any content there is content it's a little it's less sticky um, often less prominent meaning like less um, uh, there's less of it and then there sometimes is this other deeper knowing um, which can be, yeah, I don't know. How, I also don't know how to describe. And can... well, I had one interesting thing happen in that place, and it was where you had, I forget the word that you, it was the spacious awareness, you you bring it to the foreground. Yes. All right. So when you said that, I noticed that I had this image of this like, sinewy nebulous kind of light you know very subtly lit kind of film and this darkness behind it mm. right and the darkness behind it was was i was bringing to the foreground right so the the nothingness behind it and then i had this thought that the that everything else that was happening and changing that I was the, the, the visions that I were having was having were ways of describing they were descriptive of of the nothingness it was mm. the nothingness becoming something mm. yeah I mean it's so there's so many ways that uh, I think we can come into awareness I, I don't even think there's yeah. can be an exhaustive uh, but it, it's it is the felt sense but then again it doesn't have to be like that tangible embodied and so interesting what marto was saying about you know wanting to go to this transcendent place but we're, we are still embodied but it's not necessarily in the battle with the body spacious awareness can create you know because it's activating the subtle body and the awareness body some of our aches and pains and discomforts actually become saturated with that awareness so it's not like we're up and out but we're also not like dragged and down and yeah we'll just keep talking circles around it till we find our sense of ease and i will say it is it's a bit like you know trying to tell someone how to walk like you're like so you put a foot there and then you put a foot there and then don't look and don't and then when you're walking you're you're walking there's no concept of walking there's no confusion of walking so that's the sense of um, being in, um, being aware of awareness. Love this topic. Let's talk about getting our Bodhisattva activities together, y'all. Um, and I do, you know, it's interesting more and more with awareness, I think it's the deep nourishment we need to do this work. It's not like the end goal. It's not as though we experience non-dual awareness for a moment or for a long time and we're good. We don't have to be nice to anybody anymore. <laughs> we still have to work on being bodhisattvas every day. It's just that, you know, the space between the stimulus and response, as Viktor Frankl says, like that, it gets longer. It gets, we get more free. It's more available. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, mo we're moving from being like a log to gathering our virtue. And man, there are some zingers. <laughs> 
I really like this chapter. Um, there's a, yeah, yeah. So this this first stanza here, and, and for folks who haven't been here, there's these stanzas that are from Shantideva, this eighth century teacher, and then commentary by Pema. Um, and this is a stanza by Shantideva. With perfect and unyielding faith, with steadfastness, steadfastness, respect and courtesy, with modesty and conscientiousness, work calmly for the happiness of others. Like very specific, <clears throat> with perfect and unyielding faith, uh, feels a little awkward for many of us, with steadfastness, which, you know, is a word very unfamiliar in our common vocabulary, respect and courtesy, with modesty and conscientious, conscientiousness, work calmly for the happiness of others. And I, I really love the way that Pema unpacks, especially um, these ideas about what virtue is. She says that, you know, virtue is our ability to cultivate the skills and qualities that make us more available to love, since we're already very skilled at cultivating the qualities that block that goodness. And so when we're gathering virtue, it's like we're kind of warming up and making more clear and apparent that which makes us aligned with this value of the Bodhisattva, the warrior of compassion. And, and then she wanted to unpack here a little bit of these qualities. She talks about these two different kinds of faith um, in the Buddhist practice. And the first one is an eager faith. And this eager faith, again, the word faith might not resonate for everybody, but this idea of once we recognize that we could alleviate some of our own suffering and that would alleviate the suffering of others, we're like, sign me up. Like, I gotta do it. And this idea of like, kind of, it's almost like, how do we keep that faith alive, for lack of a better word? How do we keep remembering and kind of seeing over and over that when we choose to try to you know find our happiness and well-being just through external circumstances often it doesn't give us what we're looking for but when we are moving towards this sense of can i feel a little more present with this person in front of me who's going through something difficult we realize oh wow the benefit is huge like they are benefited from my presence and i am benefited from um, helping them. So this kind of eager faith. Um, the second is this confident faith. And this, she says, is the confidence in bodhicitta. It's when we can really kind of cross that bridge over from, uh, I think I want to be nice to everyone because everyone actually has this core that makes them good to, I know that we are all good fundamentally. And you know, we come to this in so many different ways in this text, but this idea of our core goodness, our Buddha nature, our basic goodness, as Chogyam Trungpa says, it really has to be more than faith, actually. It has to be kind of this concrete, true, um, like base level truth that we know. And that can be really tricky because look at this world that we live in in which many people are not acting from this place of basic goodness. But again, if, whether we are looking through the field of anthropology, sociology, psychology, or physics, goodness is what we are. It's not the only thing we are. And in some ways, this kind of faith is, I choose to see this part of what we are. And, and I really like this idea, again, you know, we're choosing our attention to come back and we're choosing to really align ourselves with the good. Not to deny that there's a lot of harmful behaviors that people learn when the good gets covered over, but that there is good that's kind of right underneath. And when or if we see that fundamental goodness, it's like choiceless. Of course we wanna be bodhisattvas. Of course we wanna, like if everyone's good, well then we wanna help out. Um, and then we need the training to do so, so we don't burn out uh, and try too hard. Then she talks about steadfastness, <laughs> which is not a word I think about a lot. I'm not sure I've ever used, has anyone used the word steadfastness recently? 
not steadfastness, <laughs> being steadfast is something that I'm familiar with. Because life has all these challenges. That's right. That I've had to me for a long time just try to avoid. Yeah. And then found that that wasn't working. And then in meeting these challenges, I had to be steadfast in order to um, to deny my urge to break and run. <laughs> and to just, to just stick with it. Yep. You know? Yep. Because I do have that tendency. I just want to avoid shit. I mean, we all do. <laughs> yeah yeah and and i really i like the steadfastness description she gives here which is very similar which is there's these inevitable difficulties in life and we kind of got to hang in with all of them right like not when conditions are good right um we stick with ourselves through all kinds of moods and states of mind you know, it can be really hard <clears throat> to be present and to want to keep practicing when we're, you know, feeling overwhelmed or feeling distressed or tired. And it's just kind of this steadfastness as this quality. And then this quality of modesty and humility. And I love here, she says that this comes naturally when we're attentive. <laughs> if we really pay attention to how we act, the only appropriate response is humility. <laughs> Essentially, like none of us are doing it right. We're all just bumbling along, so let's be humble. <laughs> and I like that, it's true, right? And so when we see how reactive we are, how unkind we can be, this humbles us. Instead of causing despair, this painful realization can connect us with the tenderness of bodhicitta. So like, oh man, am I blowing it all the time? I so want to do better. How beautiful that I want to do better. So that's, um, yeah. And then, and then conscien conscientiousness, also not something I think I talk about a lot, um, but this idea that there's a diligence and honesty. It feels so old fashioned, these ideas, and yet there's so much um, beauty in, in having that kind of self-responsibility you know, and self-accountability. So just one more time, with perfect and unyielding faith, with steadfastness, steadfastness, man, respect and courtesy, with modesty and conscientiousness, work calmly for the happiness of others. So just really, you know, kind of every word there um, has so much, so much instruction in how to be and then these next ones, man, are these appropriate for our times. Let us not be downcast by the warring wants of childish persons quarreling. Their thoughts are bred from conflict and emotion. Let us understand and treat them lovingly. Let us not be downcast by the warring wants of childish persons quarreling. Their thoughts are bred from conflict and emotion. Let us understand and treat them lovingly. So, you know, this idea that in order for us to gather virtue, we have to be able to deal compassionately with each other. And uh, warring wants, I don't, even, I don't really even know exactly what that means, but this idea that, you know, this childish quarreling, she says this isn't actually uh, kind of meant to be, you know, putting anyone down. It's not to be like, oh, these childish people, but meant that there's this, immature way of seeing the world when we want our idea or our point of view to be right. And there's a very, there's a lack of maturity in that. Um, and that we can um, easily judge others when they're caught up in these warring wants, in this kind of childlike quarreling. Anybody see that happening <laughs> in the world? <laughs> and that, you know, it's so easy to like have contempt you know, contempt, this like asserting of superiority, like, my God, I can't believe they're this, that, or the other, and oh, my God. But instead, let us understand and treat them lovingly. Like just to kind of cut directly through 
and cut through our own judgment and cut through our contempt and recognize their thoughts are bred from conflict and emotion. So that's a really tall order. <laughs> and yet, you know, I love that this is part of gathering virtue. You know, part of, it's true, you know, you think about what's in the way of treating everybody with that sense of bodhicitta and love. And very often it's our judgment and contempt and we're judging others, you know, kind of as wrong or harmful or bad in some way. But she's saying, <clears throat> as we stabilize our mind, we see more honestly how we get incited and how difficult it is to remain like a log. So then we watch others, we can treat them lovingly, how we would want to be treated in that same predicament without being condescending or disapproving. We realize our sameness and communicate from the heart kind of ties back into humility, seeing our own struggles. <laughs> this might be my favorite one of the chapter. <clears throat> when doing virtuous acts beyond reproach to help ourselves or for the sake of others, let us always bear in mind the thought that we are selfless like an apparition. So I, I love what this points out, which is our tendency that if we do find ourselves acting out of virtue, we almost immediately want to be like congratulated. <laughs> I know for sure in like a close relationship, right? And let's say our partner is kind of like throwing a fit and we're like, hmm, and we don't get involved and ensnared. And then they calm down and we're like, wasn't I great? You know, <laughs> you're freaking out. No, it's just like, we. it's just this kind of tendency to want to be like seen and champion. <laughs> so much knowing laughter in the room. <laughs> just like this moral high ground we immediately place ourselves on, right? And this idea of doing it without that need of being affirmed, doing it because it is the right thing to do. And of course, we're going to benefit from it. If we got ensnared in that little whatever was going on with our partner or our friend, for sure it would make it worse. Like we already benefit. And this idea of, um, she's saying, identifying oneself as the virtuous one. Um, but we have to kind of really question the solidity of this identity and contemplate this idea, you know, this, this selflessness like an apparition. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful image. It's... Um, she names this uh, kind of aphorism of we could apply the threefold purity, making no big deal about the doer, no big deal about what's being done, and no big deal about the result. It's kind of the no big deal teaching. I think you can go pretty far, right, of just no big deal. I'm just acting like a bodhisattva right now, no problem. <laughs> no big deal. Nobody's watching. Nobody saw it. Um, and that's great. And then, yeah, there's just two, two more here I want to share. Uh, almost always, I feel like in every chapter, there's a reminder Shantideva has for us that this supreme treasure of human life, so long awaited, now at last attained, reflecting always thus, maintain your mind as steady as Sumeru, king of the mountain. And just this idea that like, no matter what part of the Bodhisattva training we're in, just remembering what a gift it is to be in this human body, heart and mind, where we're able to like take these teachings on, where we're able to learn and to grow. And, you know, of course, if, if you're um, more deeply adhered into the Buddhist cosmology, the idea is that you might have been waiting lifetimes for this opportunity and that this has implications for lifetimes to come. Even if it's just this lifetime, there's so much benefit we can achieve by starting to kind of shake out some of the conditioning that prevents us from seeing ourselves and others clearly. So just that reminder, you know, can feel like a lot of to-dos <laughs> and a lot of, um, you know, self-improvement, but it is a gift, right, to be alive in this time and alive with these teachings. These next stanzas, they are, they're a little in, intense. They really get into kind of at their core, the way that being too obsessed with our physical form and body can get in the way of our gathering of virtue. 
Um, and Shanti Deva, you know, sometimes knows how to really bring it. So he says, when vultures with their love of flesh are tugging at this body all around, small will be the joy you get from it. <laughs> oh, mind, why are you so besotted with it now? <laughs> so essentially, you know, when we're dead and if you have a sky burial, as you often do um, in Tibet, you know, so they leave your body out and the vultures slowly tear it apart. Uh, why are you so obsessed with your body if eventually that will be its fate? And I, I get it. Um, this idea of obsessing of our body can make us sell, so self-absorbed. We can't see beyond our own needs. Um, there is sometimes a level of such intense austerity and uh, just personally, in, in my own path, in my own dharma, I don't think negating uh, sensory pleasure is the path. I think sensory pleasure can be part of the path. And I think this is a kind of a bit more of a monastic, you know, approach um, where it's so hard to deny sensory pleasure from the body, you kind of have to really over and over kind of hammer it in there. Um, but we'll do a couple more hammering in just, just to give Shanti Deva his due. Why, oh mind, do you protect this body, claiming it as though it were you yourself? You and it are each a separate entity. How can it ever be as of use to you? First, with mind's imagination, shed the covering of skin, and with the blaze of wisdom, strip the flesh off the bony frame. And when you've divided all the bones and searched right down amid the very marrow, you should look and ask the question, where is thingness to be found or where is me to be found? And so the idea here, and, and this I really do appreciate, is beyond the materialist view of this body as the entirety of who I am, there is this possibility um, that some of us might feel closer to than others, that consciousness is more than the body. And um, any scientist, especially neuroscientist, with intellectual humility will recognize we can't actually explain consciousness within the brain. There is more than is in this body. That's humble and it's magical. And so if we just kind of associate all of who we are with this body, we are setting ourselves up for a race against time. This body is on its way to death and decay, if we're lucky, old age, right? And so unhooking ourselves from an obsession with the body, not only can it help us see others' needs beyond our own, but it can help set us up well for the reality, right, of this body um, being a vessel that will, in time, degrade. Um, mm -mm -mm. Da, 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 da. So pay this body due remuneration, but then be sure to make it work for you. Do not lavish everything on what will not be bring perfect benefit. So kind of give your body what it needs. And I would even say, treat your body like a temple. And then, you know, don't get so obsessed. But this phrase, I, I really, I've always loved this one. Um, Regard your body as a vessel a simple boat for going here and there, make of it a wish-fulfilling gem to bring about the benefit of all beings. So regard your body as a vessel, a simple boat for going here and there, make of it a wish-fulfilling gem to bring about the benefit of beings. And I think it's such a, a noble and beautiful way to think of this body, right? That we could make of it a wish-fulfilling gem. And I think within that we can find that, you know, how do we make enjoyment through this body part of our path? And way earlier in the first chapter, you know, part of our offering, part of our way of uh, connecting with bodhicitta is whenever we taste, like I had a beautiful curry, I know I always talk about food, but I had a beautiful <laughs> curry for dinner and you can immediately offer that up. May all beings know the nourishment and the flavor of this. And then if we, like I smelled the beautiful flower on the street, may all beings know. So we can create through our sensual pleasure, a connection of care and love to all beings as well. So I think, I think there's a way to hold this gathering of virtue together. Um, I'm gonna stop with the, those there tonight. 
Did anybody have a question or reflection on this gathering of virtue section? I know it's a little bit um, full with its faith, steadfastness, respect, <laughs> courtesy, modesty, conscientiousness. Um, yeah. Any? Yeah, Chris. How is this like or distinct from the generation of merit? Yeah, I think great question. You know, we are, as we are gathering virtue, we are likely generating merit. But specifically and explicitly, these are like these three disciplines. You know, the Tibetan Buddhists, they love their lists. So there's probably a sub list in which merit <laughs> is underneath. But with, with merit, it's like any activity that we do, there's the potential that if we do it with this full intention of bodhicitta, it, it kind of, you know, I like to think of merit as an energy. It's an energy that is being developed towards the support of all beings. And when we're gathering virtue, especially in the way it's described here, we're applying this, you know, you could call it discipline, accountability, responsibility. Like, what is it we are needing to do in order to become more of this wish fulfilling gem? So there's a, a kind of, uh, I almost think of it as that planting in the garden of those positive seeds and merit is more what we get to actually offer to others. I never thought about it before, so thank you. I might think about it again and give you a different answer next week. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions or reflections? Yes, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> um, you may have already said this, but I was wondering how you are connecting this section to the specific meditation that we did. Mm, yeah, I didn't, but good question. Um, you know, I think in general with discipline, it's really hard to recognize when we fall away if we're not paying close attention. And though we, I could see how these disciplines might invite or incite us towards compassion for ourselves, this developing of the meta awareness so that we can recognize the thoughts as they arise. I think this is such a core part of, of discipline. And the specific in terms of the mindfulness of phenomena, you know, I, I just, this practice in general feels like so foundational to being able to cultivate attention. Um, yeah, it felt like a good one for this one tonight on the gathering of virtue. Though I could easily see that in like a gathering of virtue practice, doing loving kindness or any of the Brahma Viharas, like whenever we're tenderizing the heart to make ourselves more available, it's also really a gathering of virtue. So yeah, thank you. And um, I have a question for folks in this room, including Cage, because she's here right now. <laughs> the, we have next Wednesday, and then we have Christmas Eve and New Year's Day, like all the Wednesdays, like big. So, huh? Christmas, Day. Christmas Day and then New Year's Day. So Christmas Day, no go. Sorry. I mean, I'm going to be at dim sum and... Uh, a movie with my dad, um, but you know, just such a closed down time. But if we did an intention setting on New Year's Day, would folks be interested? Raise of hand, no judgment. But I just don't want to do it. Maybe. Okay. Oh yeah, there's some hands over there, because it's it's kind of nice because we're on New Year's Day, right? It's intention setting. Okay, cool. Um, sweet. Let us do the thing of dedicating merit. So coming back into our attention and awareness directed at the body and the breath. Feeling the preciousness of being here together, and gathering our hearts and our energies. And if it's comfortable placing hands together in front of the heart in a symbolic gesture of offering, 
whatever energy or light, warmth or care we feel we may have participated in or experienced tonight, we offer this up that all beings of all time could know peace and belonging, that all beings could feel connected and loved, that all beings could be safe from inner and outer harm. Dedicating this energy and light and love that all beings could be free. Thank you all so much.